Hello and welcome to another episode of Inside Look. My name is Katrine Gonzalez, multimedia reporter at Inquirer.net. And joining us today is Dr. Gita Davin of the Octa Research. And in this interview, we'll try to make sense of the COVID-19 numbers we are seeing in the Philippines. Good morning, Dr. Guido. Hi, good morning, Catherine. So let's start by analyzing the latest COVID-19 data in the NCR. The Octa Research has said in its latest monitoring report dated April 25, that the reproduction number in the NCR has decreased to 0.93 from April 18 to 24. Um, for the information of our viewers, can you explain to us what does this mean and how significant this is in terms of the development of um, the COVID-19 situation in the NCR? Yes. Uh, the reproduction number measures the average number of uh, uh, infections made by one infected <laughs> individual. So this is an average number on, on aggregate. So uh, before uh, the GCQ bubble, the reproduction number in Metro Manila was 2.04. And um, before the implementation of uh, ECQ, it was 1.88. So it was uh, approximately two. So what that means is uh, one person infected with COVID will infect two other people. Now, by the time, um, uh, well, uh, by, by as of yesterday, actually, the reproduction number that we have seen, that we have measured or estimated, is 0 0.89. So it, in fact, uh, decreased even further um, compared to 0 0.93, which was uh, about two days ago. Um, so this is less than one. When the reproduction number is less than one, that means uh, the uh, surge is slowing down because each person is infecting less than one person, one other person. And that means uh, the number of cases is starting to decrease. And this is actually what we're seeing in NCR, for example, over the past seven days, the average number uh, of new cases is around 3,500 per day. Um, and this is 24% uh, less than the average uh, one week ago, which was 4,682. So the, uh, to be specific, the average we see uh, as of yesterday for March, uh, sorry, for April 19 to 25 is 3,578. And one week ago, it was 4,682. And uh, three weeks ago, during the peak of the search, it was 5,552. So compared to the peak, of 5,500, the average has already decreased by 35%. So this is a significant uh, decrease in cases. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, there's a significant improvement in the number of uh, uh, cases that we're recording per day in NCR. Do you think this is already the effect of the three-week ECQ that, that was implemented in the NCR before? Yes, uh, Catherine, definitely. Uh, this is uh, a positive effect of the lockdown that we had two weeks of ECQ and uh, um, uh, ECQ has to illustrate how, uh, how much the trend has reversed. Before the GCQ, um, we were seeing an increase in cases by up to 70% every week. So that means uh, every, uh, you know, if we had that number this week, next week, the average number will be 70% higher. And uh, the, the GCQ bubble uh, slowed it down a little. It decreased the, the growth rate to 40%. Um, but after that, um, it became a negative growth rate uh, during the implementation of ECQ. Uh, so, so this is definitely an effect of the ECQ and MEC. I see. Um, how about when we look closer to the 17 LGUs in Metro Manila? Um, which cities have shown the, the most significant decrease in the numbers? And which cities did not show that much um, significant decrease? Yes, and that's, uh, that's a good point. Um, the difference in the surge that happened this uh, March 2021 compared to last year, 
um, which happened in uh, July to August. Uh, what happened last year, uh, all the cities were having the surge at the same time. And uh, the effect of that was that the NCR surged at the same time and um, they all recovered at the same time. Um, the difference now is the surge happened early year or start, uh, the surge started earlier in uh, some cities, uh, including Pasay, uh, Manila, and the Vodas. And then, well, we could see also earlier in these same cities. So we have seen uh, two to three weeks of negative growth rate. That means two to three weeks of decreasing cases in these cities that I mentioned. So that includes Pasay, uh, Manila. Um, uh, I think I mentioned um, uh, Navotas. And then uh, we're also seeing a two week decrease in Muntinlupa uh, and a few other uh, cities. Now, I, I could not name every city because some cities had a positive increase last week and a negative decrease, uh, a negative growth rate this week. So we can't really say that it has a consistent downward trend. Uh, in fact, most cities have are in that situation, um, except for the few. Um, I, I think I may have to add that there are a few other cities like Caloocan and maybe Paranaque, which have a two-week uh, decrease. And uh, I think Pateras also. I think that's good news, at least for the NCR. But how about um, the situation in other provinces in the NCR Plus, specifically in Cavite, Laguna, uh, Bulacan, and Rizal? And we were hoping that the same trends would be seen um, in the... Uh, provinces within the bubble outside NCR. Uh, and yes, we're seeing a decrease in many LGUs. For example, Dasmarinas Cavite is having a decrease. Cainta, um, Antipol is having a significant decrease. Um, but it's not uniform. So we're also seeing a one week growth rate, for example, in Baco or Cavite. So, uh, but uh, overall, uh, there is a decrease in um, Calabarzon. Uh, I think the decrease was something like around 12%. Um, and there's a slight decrease in central Luzon, but uh, it's uh, off, I would say it's balanced by uh, a significant decrease in Bulacan, but it's balanced by um, uh, an increase that we're seeing in Pampanga and Batangas outside the bubble. But within the bubble, uh, overall it's decreasing but there are some LGUs that are still showing a an increase like um, Bacoor. But how about um, in other areas outside the NCR plus bubble? Have you noticed a significant downward trend or perhaps an increasing trend in other areas outside NCR plus? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, in some major areas like, uh, for example, Cebu and uh, Davao, the trend is... Uh, good, um, they're seeing a downward trend, and they're not seeing a high number of cases, especially Cebu, which uh, recovered from a surge that happened from January to February, and it's already on the, in the recovery stage. Um, uh, elsewhere, we're seeing, I wouldn't say an, uh, an increase, but a rather unstable trend in um, Isabela and in uh, Banget in particular. So in, in these areas, in, in the Cordillera administrative region and in uh, Cagayan Valley. So we're seeing uh, a rather um, unstable trend. And based on our uh, last report, we actually noted that, well, the uh, if we are just looking at regions, uh, Central Luzon, uh, sorry, um, Cordillera administrative region had an increase of 5%, but it's very slight. And all the other regions outside NCR, Calabarzon, Central Luzon, Cagayan, Cagayan Valley, CAR, Western Visayas, and Central Visayas had a growth rate of about 3%. So this accounts for some uh, increases that's happening in uh, other, the trend is 
not really a significant increase. Um, it's sort of flattish uh, trend. But at the same time, uh, because of this, well, the, the numbers have not really, I mean, nationally, the numbers have not really improved that much. Well, they have improved. Um, nationwide, we are now averaging uh, 8,700 cases per day uh, compared to 10,000 uh, the previous week. So that's actually a significant, a, a, a decent improvement. It's a 14% decrease, but it's not, the decrease is not as uh, large as what we saw in NCR because, as I mentioned, there are still some provinces outside the NCR bubble that are seeing a slight increase or uh, an unstable trend, which means that it's sometimes increasing and sometimes decreasing. So there's no clear uh, trend. Um, you you mentioned the reproduction number. We were talking about the reproduction number in Metro Manila, but nationwide, um, what's the reproduction number in of COVID nineteen in the country? Yes, uh, I, I believe. Um, I, okay, I'm I'm gonna double check the exact number right now because uh, I have my uh, seven days. It's also. Uh, less than one, it's 0 0.90. So this is confirmed by the fact that the cases actually had a negative growth rate. So it's slightly less than one, but the, uh, the reproduction number in NCR is better. It's 0 0.89 as of now, because of, uh, as I mentioned, a significant decrease in cases observed for the past week. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned the less than one reproduction number in Metro Manila. If I'm not mistaken, I think Okta Research said before that the reproduction number for the country should always be less than one for it to be considered um, at a good level. So let's talk about the next quarantine status, especially in NCR Plus, because it is uh, the MECQ is expiring on April 30. So considering the reproduction number in every uh, in other um, COVID-19 data that uh, we we've noticed that our that our not is less than one already. What's the recommendation of Dr. Research in terms of quarantine status for the NCR Plus? Yeah. Yes. So I'd like to clarify that um, the reproduction number is less than one. That's good. The positivity rate is decreasing. Um, it's at 19% in NCR. Uh, it was as high as 25%. So that's also good. It's decreasing, but at the same time, the positivity rate is still high. I mean, 19%. Um, anything above 10% is uh, generally considered a high positivity rate. Uh, uh, and then the, uh, um, the number of cases has also decreased, as we mentioned. Um, the decrease is significant. 24% uh, decrease compared to last week. Uh, that being said, um, the trend is still fairly unstable in the NCR because, as we mentioned, there are some LGUs which have, a, which have shown a significant improvement and a downward trend, but there are also uh, other LGUs which have an unstable trend at the moment, which means that they only had one week of decrease the previous week. It was still increasing, so it's too early to say if it's really going to be de decreasing from here on. So, and the other most important uh, indicator is that hospitals are still generally full. It's still difficult to get hospital admission, which is uh, possibly the main reason that we moved the NCR plus to uh, ECQ and MECQ in the first place because hospitals were not able to keep up with the number of um, admissions of people wanting or needing to be admission and hospital admission will remain high for the next few weeks because even if we decrease the number of cases to 3,000 um, then uh, it's still a significant number. We hope that we could decrease it down to uh, 2,000 per day in NCR and uh, it, it will take uh, maybe a few weeks uh, maybe two to three weeks to get there uh, if we look at the current trend. So um, in terms of hospitalization, uh, this was actually the basis for the, um, the group 
recommendation, which is to extend the MECQ. By how, how long, it will depend on, you know, on the numbers that we're seeing. So basically the group as a whole of the research uh, recommended an extension of MECQ for, on the basis that uh, number one, hospitals are still full. Number two, the trend is still unstable, which means that some LGs are still seeing an increase in cases. And we are uh, concerned that if we ease restrictions too quickly, then the cases might start to increase and we might uh, lose the gains that we made during the ECQ, which was to control the pandemic and to reverse the momentum of the virus. Now, that being said, that's the group position. Uh, and the, the, the position is based purely on the, on the public health aspect. So we're not looking at the economic aspect, which is of course the task of the economic managers. And you know, we understand that uh, livelihoods, um, jobs have been lost. And we understand that the go national government will um, work on balancing these two main factors or considerations. So balancing livelihood and public health, balancing economy and you know, hospital uh, needs. So that being said, uh, me personally, uh, speaking for myself, uh, uh, I, I, I would understand if the national government were to uh, decide to ease some restrictions, uh, if this is the direction that the national government will take, uh, my, my recommendation is that we don't ease the restrictions too quickly. So we can probably um, retain MECQ and uh, you know, ease some restrictions and open a few more businesses. Or you know, if they decide to move to a GCQ, it could be a stricter GCQ like what we had a few weeks ago during the GCQ bubble, wherein um, not all businesses are open. So what I'm saying is that if we are going to decide to open anyway, uh, we should do so gradually. And we should always um, make sure that it's calibrated and it's based on science, meaning that uh, activities that are of high risk, such as, um, uh, dining in restaurants should not be allowed yet because this is a high risk for community transmission. But there are some, and uh, I'd like to add to that, that um, you know, in terms of public transportation, uh, we probably, it probably would not be advisable to increase capacity in public transportation yet. We could add more public transportation and uh, we could add more capacity to certain establishments, for example, uh, churches, we could maybe increase from 10% capacity to 20%, and we can do so in other establishments um, as long as they're not subject to do high risk. So as long as people generally don't remove their face masks in public, because our, our, our understanding of this virus is that it's airborne and it's really um, relatively easy to get infected once you get uh, once you remove your face mask in public that's why when people um cluster together um in offices and well or eat together in offices um that's usually source of transmission uh the, the other thing i'd like to add is um one of our um, fellows in okta who's also a doctor a medical doctor in cebu uh, informed us that uh, one of the uh, activities they focused on was uh, palenques or wet markets. And he mentioned that this is also a, a, high, uh, a source of community. So look at our you know, palenques and not just palenques, but other activities that may lead to uh, you know, crowding of people and that may be a cause for community transmission. So aside from Palenques, um, I, I believe um, I, I heard from the DILG USEC earlier today that they have fixed the, um, uh, the giving out of Ayudas. So what the other you know, activity that we could you know, look at would be um, the community pantries, which we fully support, 
but um, I believe that they could be done in a proper way, which would um, reduce the risk of community transmission. So we support them, but we uh, hope that they could perhaps coordinate with local government so that um, uh, health protocols will be um, uh, followed in the community pantries. So those are some examples that, you know, um, uh, when we are going to ease uh, certain restrictions, we should at least um, look at each one individually, make sure that they're calibrated and they won't lead to uh, high risk for community transmission. Yeah, it's, uh, it's also good that you mentioned community pantries because they're sprouting everywhere. Um, we understand the purpose, but like you said, it's still important to observe the health standards or the health protocols for it to not be an area of transmission. Now, uh, moving on to another topic that's not related, um, that's not directly related to the COVID-19 numbers. Let's talk about the case fatality rate, computation of offset. And um, before there was an issue, uh, I think it's, a, it's just a recent issue with the DOH, that the OCTA research released a figure that is um, significantly higher than the CFR reported by the DOH. I'm not sure if that's only for Metro Manila, I think, yeah, I think that's for Metro Manila only. This, the CFR that you reported, that is over five. But the DOH uh, said that the CFR in Metro Manila is only above one. So for the record, um, how does the OCTA research compute the case fatality rate? Because um, I think you think very Harry mentioned before that in the field of epidemiology, there are other differing opinions. And one of those um, topics na iba iba po yung opinions na experts ay the computation of the CFR. So how does the OCTA research compute the CFR? All right. Um, I, I would like to answer that, but um, we are also scheduled to have a meeting with um, the Department of Health, and we're actually going to talk about this. So I don't want to um, say something that would, um, you know, um, preempt what we are going to be talking about in the, the meeting with the Department of Health because they are also, they have reached out to us and they are also wondering about, you know, the calculation of the case fatality rate. Uh, having said that, those were preliminary um, calculations. Uh, the numbers since then have decreased. In fact, they, it, the case fatality rate is now underestimated, but we're still seeing a case fatality rate of about 2.2%. Uh, as compared to the Department of Health calculation. And um, without preempting our, you know, the, the meeting, what I'd like to mention is that um, well, we know how they calculate their case fatality rate. They base it on total number of cases in our calculation. We base it on uh, cases that have been resolved. So we don't include active cases in the calculation. That's the main difference. And that is actually, we actually um, go by the formula that's in the WHO website um, for estimating case fatality rate. So our fear is that when we use, when we don't, in, uh, when we include active cases, some of which have not been resolved yet, the case fatality rate will be underestimated. And I'll give you an example. Um, if there are, um, for example, 1 million cases, like right now, and we have, let's say, 15,000 deaths, um, then the case fatality rate will be, um, if we use the total number, then it will be 15,000 divided by 1 million. So um, I believe that would be about 1.5%. Um, but some of these cases are still active, and some of them, may still die so uh, and, and that's the reason how we don't use the total number of cases we exclude the active cases because some of them may still die and some of them will still count towards the deaths i sorry i hope that was sort of clear i mean yeah I see, I understand. Because um, I think what Yusek Verher explained in the past is the DOH com computes the CFR based on the number of total active cases 
over ay, based on the total number of deaths over the number of active cases or total cumulative number of cases. Yes. So that I see it as the difference. Okay. Yes. So um, you mentioned that there the CFR right. is still at two point two percent. Um, is it only for NCR or for the uh whole country? Yeah, that's actually for NCR only. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've also mentioned that uh, you have to have a schedule for a meeting with uh, DOH. Um, may I know when is the meeting expected to materialize? Uh, it's going to be this Wednesday, Wednesday morning. Mm, I see. And aside from the CFR, is there anything else or any other topic that uh, that is expected to be discussed during your during your meeting with the DOH? There might be some other uh, minor topics. Uh, I think they want to uh, check with the, the, the methods for calculating the reproduction number, uh, which we have already you know, uh, explained in the past in, uh, in some of my uh, lectures, webinars. I, I, I have explained how we calculate the reproduction number. Um, I believe they make their own calculation, and it's uh, a little different from what we uh, obtain. And uh, we can actually explain why the reproduction number is different because we are actually using slightly different models. All right, thank you for that explanation, Dr. Guido David. Now for your um, final message for your last message, message to our viewers. Yes, um, thank you again for you know, inviting me to give our uh, you know, position on this, uh, or at least, you know, for me to discuss the findings of our reports, which we have, we have been publishing our reports uh, since April of last year. And uh, we do this almost, I mean, every week and sometimes more than once a week, uh, sometimes almost every day, especially when we're updating the reproduction number, like what we're doing now. Um, this is a pandemic that has, of course, um, affected a lot of people like you, like everyone, uh, we can't wait for the pandemic to be over. So we're doing our best to help. Uh, the pandemic is still here. The virus is still here. You know, more virus variants are, you know, popping up elsewhere in the world. Uh, we, we have to do our best to contain the surge. Um, I believe that we're uh, scheduled to receive uh, a few million doses of vaccine the second quarter, and then by the third quarter, I'll, I'll be—I believe we'll be receiving a significant, significant number of uh, doses. It's important for us to get vaccinated so that um, this will accelerate our economic recovery, our full recovery. I, I can't promise that we'll get back to the old normal where people don't have to wear face masks. But we probably don't have to wear face masks in certain places, but in public places, we'll still have to wear face masks, even if we're vaccinated. But basically what I'm saying is um, we see the light at the end, the end of the tunnel. Uh, they're already see, experiencing this now. For example, in Israel, um, they vaccinated a significant portion of their population, and uh, they're already uh, enjoying the benefits of having uh, some semblance of the old normal. And this is what we're going to be seeing. Uh, of course, I urge the national government to prioritize vaccination in NCR because the NCR and Calabarzon has the most need for this to get back to the old normal. But in the meantime, we need to follow the guidelines. We need to wear our face masks properly, do social distancing, avoiding crowded places, uh, avoiding co close contacts because this is the way we can protect ourselves from getting infected with COVID. So uh, basically um, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, vaccines will be coming in in quantity. We urge the national government to uh, prioritize NCR so we can accelerate um, economic recovery and going back to normalcy. Um, so, uh, but in the meantime, let's uh, follow the guidelines. And it's important that we do so it's important that we follow um, protocols wherever we are. So wh whether we're in, you know, um, offices, uh, we're, you know, we're getting um, 
um, food from community pantry, which we support. Let's follow guidelines. Let's wear face masks. Let's wear face masks properly. Our understanding of this virus, this variant, is that it's airborne. It can be transmitted air, um, uh, by air, by aerial droplets. And if we don't wear face masks and we, we don't wear face masks properly, we can catch the droplets and get infected. So um, let's take care of ourselves. Uh, I know already a lot of people who have gotten infected. It's still difficult to get hospital admission. So the best way to, you know, to, to fight the virus is to prevent transmissions. That's the best way we can deal with this invisible enemy. So, so social distancing, wearing face mask, face shield. Let's do our part. Let's help each other. We need to help each other. We need to work together to beat this virus. And then we can you know, go back to the old normal uh, in maybe a few months. Not the old normal, but a new type of normal, maybe with some face mask. But at least you know, our, our old way of life, we can uh, recover our economy, you know, our you know, small businesses that have been affected. We hope they can bounce back and uh, uh, recover. So thank you again. Thank you very much, sir. And yeah, hopefully we will be able to go back soon to that kind of new normal, whatever um, I think of the better new normal that we can have in the country. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Gita David. And that's it for today's Inside Look. Join us again for another episode only here on inquire.net.